Let's all stand and we'll pray and we'll take a moment and just worship the Lord. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, we thank you so much for the technology where we can reach people all over the world with your Torah simultaneously. This is an exciting adventure that we're on. Uh, you have created us for such a time as this. Every single person that's in this room is a person of destiny. Everyone that's watching us, Father, is a person of destiny. For such a time as this, you've created us. We could have been born in any other generation, but you wanted us here at this time to hear from you. So Father, I pray you would just inspire every one of us here, that your Holy Spirit would just breathe upon us, that we would get excited about what you're doing in these last days, and we would be powerhouses for you. Put us in the game, coach. We just thank you so much. In Yeshua's name, amen. Uh, one of the things I want to mention is, uh, how many of you were not here on Shabbat? Okay, for those of you that weren't here, I'm going to just give you a 30 second update. I tell you what, the next few weeks are going to be like the clash of the titans. You've seen some of those movies where, the old movies where they're on both sides and they, oh, they run and they come riding and crashing at each other. Well, in the spiritual realm, that's what's happening in the next few weeks. Believe it or not, this week, next week, on one side you have... Uh, the APAC meeting going on in Washington, D.C. Both Benjamin Netanyahu and Shimon Perez are going to be there at this meeting. They'll be talking uh, to President Obama about the current events in Iran, Persia, and Purim is also next week. And then at the same time, you have this Christ at the Checkpoint Conference that's going on in Bethlehem where they're trying to equate uh, Jesus being born in Bethlehem and the mean Israeli soldiers would not allow him to go to Jerusalem. Uh, it's all these Christians, big names are there speaking against uh, the Jewish people. Uh, then you also have uh, it's National Apartheid Week where all over the world on college campuses, people are building these little walls and uh, it's Bash Israel Week, so to speak. So this is what is going on around the world. We really want to just lift these situations up. So let's take a moment and pray. Father, uh, there's things going on and often we're not even aware of what's going on, but you know what's going on. And Father, right now we want you to just to touch hearts. Father, when we think of what's going on around the world on these college campuses and all over, how people are coming against your people, your land. Father, we just want to stand with them and, and be a strong support for them. Show us how we can be involved. Father, give us direction. And we just thank you for that. In Yeshua's name, amen. After the meeting tonight, be sure to get your Passover Seder tickets. I can tell you right now, we already have people flying in from Canada, from Alaska, from Texas, I think uh, Montana, I don't know, so they're coming in from all over to come to this Passover Seder. It's gonna be absolutely incredible. And I said, uh, really highly recommend you get your tickets. So let's go ahead and put up the first clip here. Okay, here's the thing. If you'll notice, what letter does these words begin with? Tet, all right, you guys were paying attention last week. Last week, Art spoke on the letter Tet. Well, as so happened, one of our internet listeners his name is Tom uh, Hoser, emailed me uh, after watching this and he said, hey, here's another interesting thought on this letter. Do you know what, this is a variation. Actually, this means the same thing. It's just a variant spelling. And it's the word for lamb as in the Passover lamb. Now, what's fascinating about this, the Hebrew word for lamb begins with the letter tet, okay? And it means to cover, to protect also. And I thought that was fascinating because here, the word lamb, the tet, here's in the ancient Paleo-Hebrew here, the tet means to surround. The lamed is a shepherd's staff, okay? And then the aleph, as Elohim, uh, represents God. And so here you have, when you look at the picture language, you're surrounded by the chief shepherd of Elohim. And that's the lamb. The Hebrew word for lamb in the picture language is to be surrounded by the chief shepherd of God. And he wants to be your protection or covering. So I think this is absolutely incredible that you can see this here in the picture language. 
And also the hay, so this is the uh, left, the hay represents the breath of God. So, you know, again, uh, if you remember like Psalms number uh, 91, where it talks about under the cover of his wings, the shadow of his wings. Well, that represents the talit, where you also probably comes from this word that begins with the letter tet. So here, the, even the word talit, the idea of covering and protection of God, uh, we can see in this word. Okay, so here, let's go to the letter Yud. Think of that very small letter. This is the ancient Paleo uh, Hebrew, what it looked like in ancient Hebrew. And what does that look like? A hand, an arm. So guess what the letter Yud or Yod means in Hebrew? Hand, okay, pretty simple. Well, the, the letter Yud is the smallest of the Hebrew letters. And it means a closed hand. The letter we're gonna look at next week is the Kaf, which represents the open hand, okay? But today we're looking at the Yud, which is the closed hand. It, it means a deed or uh, a work, something that you do, just like you work with your hands. So the, the letter Yud implies a deed, a work, something you do with your hands. What do you think is the numeric value? 10, that's right. Uh, the letter Tet has a, a numeric value of 10. And here's the interesting thing. The letter U denotes basically two things also. Power, like the right hand of God, okay? And possession. Just like if, if I grab this as a closed hand, this is mine, okay? So the, the letter U represents power and it represents possession. And you're going to see that here as I go to the next clip you see at the top is the word, what? Shem, and what does Shem mean? Name. Well, do you know what happens? The letter Yud, I said, means possession, right? When you put the letter Yud at the end of the word, that becomes my name. Okay, you see how that works? So in the Hebrew mindset, the Yud means possession. So you put Yud at the end of the word, it's not my, it's not your name, it's my name. What's fascinating, and we'll be looking at this next week, if a cough is at the end, which is an open hand, that's your name. Okay, but anyway, we'll look at that more probably next week. Now, if you look at your notes in Deuteronomy chapter 33, and here we have verse 12. It says, and of Benjamin, he said, the beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him and the Lord shall cover him all the day long and he shall dwell between his shoulders. What do you notice about this Hebrew word? I'm gonna to go to the next clip here. You'll notice the, the word Yadid, this word is the word for beloved. It can be close friend, a beloved friend. But what do you notice about it? You have Yod and Yod. It's two hands coming together that are friends or beloved. So literally in this word for beloved, you see the word for hand twice. So I did it in the ancient Hebrew. And so we see the hand at the door, a hand at the door. Okay, so it's like you're letting your friend in your house. So here in Hebrew, the, in the picture language, it's the very word for beloved friend is two hands coming together. Isn't that fascinating? Okay, let's take a look at something here that to me is quite fascinating. I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next clip now. All right, on your notes, if you have your notes, you're gonna notice in Genesis chapter two, verse 19, it says, and out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field. Now this top one is the Hebrew word for formed. And, and you can see the hand there, the, the you symbolizing hand. God is forming every beast of the field. But what's fascinating is when you look at Genesis 2, 7, when he's forming man, it says the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Here, the word has two youths. It's like God got down and used both his hands. He really got involved when it come to making man. God got someone involved with one hand to make the beast of the field, but when it comes to man, both hands are getting involved. Isn't that interesting? This is one of these anomalies that's in Hebrew that you don't see this. This is rare that you have the two yuds for this word formed. The other thing that the sages say 
The reason why there's two yuds is because it denotes that man was created not only for this world, but for the world to come. Isn't that exciting? See, so uh, he's got both hands. One hand is for this world. The other hand is for man's spiritual nature that he created us for the next world. Now, uh, I'm taking a moment here and I'm gonna jump to Psalms 119. Usually I do this at the end of this lesson, but I'm gonna jump it here in the beginning. If you remember, and I don't have it for you in Hebrew on your notes, but Psalms 119, for those that, that you that don't know, is a tribute to the Hebrew alphabet. Every eight letters has to do with one of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, okay? Like the first eight verses, every word begins with a word that begins with the letter Aleph. And so now we're on verses 73 through 80, which is a tribute to the letter Yud. And so what do we find it begins with? Your what? Hands have formed me. They fashioned me, going back to what we were just talking about in Genesis. And it's in the plural. It's not your hand, it's your hands. And so here, the, the whole eight verses have to do with the letter Yud. And so let's read what it says. Your hands have made me, they fashioned me, they give me understanding. Why? That I might learn your commandments. They that fear you, and the word fear here begins with the letter Yud. They will be glad when they see me because I have hoped in your word. I know, Lord, that your judgments are right, that you in faithfulness have afflicted me. Ooh. Let, I pray you, your merciful kindness be for my comfort according to the word to your servant. Let your tender mercies come to me that I may live for your Torah is my delight. Let the proud be ashamed for they dealt perversely with me without a cause. But I will meditate in your precepts. Let those that fear you turn to me and those that have known your testimonies. Let my heart be sound in your statutes that I may not be ashamed. Wow. You know, so God, we want his hands that have made us and fashioned us to give us understanding that we can learn his Torah. Now, let's take a look at some very interesting things. This is from Genesis 25, verse 26. Remember the story of Jacob and Esau. Who was born first? Esau. Let's take a look at this next clip. Here is the Hebrew word for heel. Okay? That's the Hebrew word for heel. And you're going to see that on your notes where it says in Genesis 25, 26, and after that came his brother out and his hand, which is what? Yod took hold on Esau's heel, which is that. And so his name was called Yaakov. So let's take a look. What's the Hebrew letter for hand or word for hand? Okay, and what's the word for heel? Akev, and what do we see? His hand grabbed his heel, so they named him Heel Grabber. That's what Yaakov's name means. Yaakov, the Yud is the hand. He grabbed his heel, and so they named him Heel Grabber. It's not trickster, it's heel grabber. Okay, that's what it is. So this is the ancient letter Yud, which represents a hand. So I had both of them coming at the same time. So you can see where they got his Hebrew name. You following? Isn't that cool? So that's where it came from. Now in Exodus chapter one, we're gonna look at verse 20 and 21. Remember the story in this chapter where the Pharaoh says to kill all the babies and the midwife says, ain't no way we're not gonna do it. It says, therefore God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and they waxed very mighty and it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. Well, here's the interesting thing. I don't have a PowerPoint for this one, but those of you that have notes can look at your notes. First off, you'll notice the last two letters, the tet and the bait, which is tov, which means good, or how he dealt well. But I want you to notice there's two letter yuds in there, and so, which is not normal. And so what the sages say is there's an extra yud there. Normally there's only one letter yud. But in this instant, all of a sudden, God decided to tell Moses, I want you to put an extra letter U in this word. And so what do we find? 
They say the extra yud here denotes they're gonna be, have the house not only in this world, but in the world to come. For like God told Abraham, he was looking for a house whose builder and maker is God. And so again, the sages say, God put the extra yud in to say not only were they rewarded in this world, but they're rewarded in the next world. Isn't that exciting? Now let's take a look. We're gonna go to this next clip here. Okay, I think I have both of them up. Now, I want you to notice this. This is another one of these uh, fascinating anomalies that you never get to see in English, but you only see in Hebrew, which is why we have this class. In Exodus 20, 12, everyone's familiar with the verse where it says, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. So here in, is the first time in Exodus 20 where it says that your days may be long. Well, guess what? This commandment is repeated in Deuteronomy chapter five, verse 16. And it says, honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you that your days may be prolonged. But guess what? This time it's spelled differently. It has two letter U's again. And so again, the sages say that this uh, extra U shows uh, it is more fully meant pertaining to the world to come. Again, those that honor their father and their mother not only will be blessed in this world, but will additionally be blessed in the olam haba or the world to come. So in the first one where it is missing, they say, well, it's being concealed in this world. Any reward received in this life is but a foretaste of the world to come. You know, it's nice to get rewarded in this life for what we do, but it's also nice to know we're gonna be rewarded in the world to come as well. And I think the reward there is gonna be so much greater than we could ever imagine it being here. I kinda like the the rates better (laughs) in heaven. Okay, let's take a look at another clip here. Anyone know what this word is? means in Hebrew? It's song. Okay, it's a song. Like you're going to sing a song. Well, in Exodus 15.1 is the song at the sea. And it says, then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song to the Lord and spake saying, I will sing unto the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. Well, the amazing thing about this word, if you'll look up here at the screen, there is a yud in front of it on your notes, how it is in the Bible. And so this tells you it was a mistranslation in English because It says, then sang, that is past tense. But in Hebrew, this is the future tense. When you put the yud in front, it's referring to the song of Moses in Revelation, then we'll sing. Isn't that incredible? So literally with the extra yud, it becomes future tense or will sing and speaks of the resurrection of the dead as indirectly referred to in Revelation where they are singing the song of Moses. Pretty cool. Okay, let's look at this next thing on our clip. What letter is that? That is the letter hey. And if you remember, the letter hey means to behold or to reveal, right? It reveals what's inside. Okay, well, at the end of a word, when the letter hey is at the end of a word, okay, it means what comes out of. Do you remember the word, word for a woman is fire, Aleph Sheen with the hay. She's what comes out of the fire. So whenever the letter hay is at the end of a word, it means what's produced, what comes out of. What happens when the letter hay is at the beginning of a Hebrew word? What does it become? The, okay? Like Shem is name. If you put the hay in front of it and have Hashem, you have the name. Okay, so it's two words. Whenever you put the hay in front of a word, that one word becomes two words in English. Is is everyone following me there? Okay, this is incredible. I'm excited. Okay, here we go. Let's look at this picture. This next picture is the letter Vav. And what does the Vav represent? A nail. You can see that it looks 
even like a nail. A nail means something that which secures or establishes. So if you look at the clip and let's bring the hammer down, boom, it's gonna connect those two boards. So the Vav is, is that which secures or establishes. It, it nails it down. We need to nail this down. When you say that, what are you saying? We need to get this together, all right? Now we're gonna go to the next clip here. Here, I have a hay, a vav, and a hay. This is the Hebrew word basically meaning to exist. Hava, to exist or to be present. Okay? To exist or to be present. Now, when you look at it with what I just told you, this being the, okay, this being a nail which connects, and at the end of a word, it means that which is revealed or comes out of. So right here, we have the nail reveals. You following me? The hay at the beginning of a word means the. Here's the nail. This means to reveal. So the nail reveals. Or we could say it this way. It's the revelation of what is holding everything together. Okay, true existence. This is what is holding everything together. This is the connection revealed. This is revealing who, what is holding everything together, right? Okay, so let's watch what happens. We're gonna go to the next clip. We have a nice little house. And how is it held together by what? Nails. nails. Every little part is held together by nails. What is nailed together is secure. In the same way that nails hold together a building making from pieces something complete, there is something that is holding together all of creation. Let's look at this next verse. In Colossians 1, verse 16 and 17, it says, for in him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things. And in, all, in him, all things are what? Held together. Okay. Now, let's go to this next clip. Again, here we have the hey, vav, hey. It's that which is connecting everything that is revealed, right? And remember, you put the letter Yud here right in front of it, we have God's name, the Yud Hey Vav Hey. He is the one, it's, and the Yud is a hand, it's his hand that is holding everything together. Isn't that incredible? <clears throat> this is the one whose hand makes what exists. Now in John chapter one, verse one and three, it says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, he was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He's the one that's holding everything together. Matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter one and verse three, it says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. This is pretty powerful. Now, I'm going to tell you something about the letter U. We're going to wax a little philosophical here. We're going to go to the next clip. And I hope I did this one right. Here we go. That is, what do you see there? A dot. The sages say the U, which is the smallest letter, is like just a simple dot. And so they said in one sense, the letter U is in every Hebrew letter because it's that first dot that you make. Okay? Now... The letter Yud being so small is also considered as just a dot. It is seen as the atom of creation. A divine point of energy from which all was created. As the letter Yud is considered as a dot, it is also considered as being a part of every letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Since God used the letters by the word of his power to hold all things together and create all things, okay, he used the letters as the building blocks of creation. The letter U symbolizes God's omnipresence. He's everywhere. Consider it this way. 
Okay, watch the screen here. Creation began with a dot, or the letter Yud, all right? And it moved downward from the heavens to the earth, forming the letter Vav. That's what connects, the Vav connects heaven and earth, okay? The divine hook of creation. And then it moved outward into the horizontal realm to form the Dalet, the doorway of creation. Now, since Yeshua upholds all of creation by the word of his power, and the letter Yud is a part of every word, the letter Yud is the starting point of God's presence in everything, the subatomic reality. And you can just see all of creation. Now, what's amazing is if you look at this picture language, here again, this is God's name. The Yud, the He, the Bob, and the He. In the ancient picture language, when Moses wrote this in the Torah, in the first Torah scroll, you have the hand revealed, the nail revealed of Yeshua. He drew the picture of a hand, a window, a nail, and a window when he wrote God's name in the Torah. Now that is pretty incredible. As a matter of fact, let me show you this. I'll go to the next clip here. Do you remember the sign on the cross? And the, they said, change it, change it. I mean, just change the lettering, change it around. I'll show you why. Because this is Yeshua, Hanatzaret, Vihamelech, Hayahudi, which is Jesus of Nazareth and the King of the Jews. You have the Yud Hey Vav He as the first letter of every word. And they're going, change it, just change it. And Pilate said, no, what I wrote is what I wrote. So here again, you see Yeshua on the cross, the hand revealed, the nail revealed, and right there across the top of it, you have the Yud Hey Vav He, which in Hebrew is the hand revealed, the nail revealed. Only God can do something like that. So if you remember the letter Gimel, those of you that were here for Gimel, how we talked about how it represented the Holy Spirit's mission in this world. This is the Holy Spirit's mission in this world was the letter Gimel. The letter He represented the Holy Spirit's mission in the heart of the believer. Well, the letter Yud represents the Holy Spirit as the very life and nature of God, okay? In Deuteronomy, on your notes, chapter 34, verse 9, it talks about how Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his yud. <laughs> he laid his hands upon him, right? Well, here's what's fascinating. In Numbers 13, 16, it says, these are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land, and Moses called Hosea, the son of Nun, Yahashua. If you, I don't have this on the notes, but what, what happened to Hosea's name? You see the letter Yud was added. Do you see that? Okay. Now, I want to show you something. Here Joshua became Yahashua, or Hosea became Yahashua. Now, oh, here you have, here I have it. Let's go. There's what it was, and then it the letter Yud was added to it. Now I wanna show you something. All of a sudden, let's go back here. Do you see what that is right there? Does any, can anyone tell me what or who that is? Abraham's wife, her name was what? Sarai, and it got changed to what? Sarah. So what did God do? He took the Yud off of Sarah's name and he, gave her a hey from God's name, the yud heh vav hey. If you remember, those of you that have been here for a while, the yud heh vav hey is God's name. God gave one letter hey to Abram, became Abraham. He gave the other letter hey out of his name to Sarai, and she became Sarah. Okay, well, there's a funny story that, of course, this happened long before Joshua came, right? Because this is during the time of Abraham and Sarah, and later is Joshua. Well, uh, the sages, they love to create these wonderful stories. 
And they said that when the letter Yud was taken out of pious Sarah's name and was changed with the letter Hey, the, the letter Yud just started flitting around the throne of God complaining, is it because I'm the smallest of the letters? Is that why you did this to me? And God calmed the letter Yud down and said that it would be added to another. So it was added to Joshua's name. What's interesting is, you know, the Lord says not one jot or tittle will pass. He might move them around but none's gonna pass. As a matter of fact, that's in Matthew chapter five and verse 18. It says, for verily, now this is Yeshua speaking here. He says, for verily I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law or the Torah until everything's fulfilled. We're gonna look at what that literally means, a jot or a tittle in just a moment. But here's the thing that's fascinating. Do you know a Torah scroll I mean, Torah scrolls can run $20,000, $50,000. I mean, it's amazing. Some people complain about having to spend $100 for a Bible, and the Jews will spend $20,000 on just the first five books. But do you know a Torah scroll is invalid if even the smallest tittle is missing from the smallest letter? You know, the Yud is the smallest letter. And when he said not one jot or tittle will pass, he's talking about the, the smallest tittle on the smallest letter. He says, none of that is going to pass. God delights in that which is small and insignificant to others. Why? To demonstrate his glory and power. That's why God loves the letter Yud. That's why he loves the little tittle on the letter Yud, because God wants us to know that he loves that which we think, the world thinks is little and insignificant. Why do you think, and we're going to look at this, he picked Israel. And what letter does Israel begin with? The letter Yud. You're gonna see this as we go. This is gonna be fun. God delights in that which is small. In Psalms chapter 69, let's look at verse 32 through 35. Here it's talking about the humble. It says, the humble shall see this and be glad and your heart shall live that seek God. For the Lord hears the poor, he despises not his prisoners. Let the heaven and the earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves therein. For God will save Zion, he will build the cities of Judah that they may dwell there and have it in possession. Who's gonna see this happen? The humble. In Deuteronomy 32 and verse 18, it says of the rock that begat you, you are unmindful and you've forgotten God that what? God, who, who not only formed man, he literally formed Israel, okay? Well, here's what's amazing. I'm gonna show you that verse, and it's on your notes, but let's go to the next clip. I'm gonna show you in Hebrew. When that verse was written, the letter Yud was made even smaller than it normally is. The small letter Yud was even decreased. And so we see how the Lord is made small when we neglect him. They said, of the rock, you've forgotten. You're unmindful. You, God is not even in your thoughts. And so here the letter Yud is made small. And yet on the other hand, Yud, hand, get it? On the other hand, we find on the occasion, remember the 10 spies that spied out the land and brought the bad report? Okay, let's look at this next one. Look at this big monster Yud that's in every Torah scroll. Now instead of being real small, this Yud representing the hand is real big, so you don't see these things in English. I mean, they could have put, made the first letter real big and real small, but they didn't. But let's look at this. It says in Numbers 14, 17, 18, God wants to destroy everybody because they refuse the land. And Moses says, I beseech you, let the power of my Lord be what? Great. And remember the hand speaks of power? Do you guys see this word right here? What is letter is this? And what's that? And what's that? So what would be that word? Gadol. Okay. Gadol, which means great. And here you see this great big yud, right? And he says, let the power of my Lord be great. What power is he talking about? The power to forgive. Do you know what takes more power to forgive than anything? I mean, that takes a lot of power. It's easy to punish. Sometimes it doesn't take a lot of power to punish, but how much power does it take to control yourself and forgive? That takes a lot of power. 
And so it says, I beseech you, let the power of my Lord be great according as you have spoken, saying the Lord is long suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity, transgression, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Well, what's amazing here is what is he, when he says the third or fourth generation, this is the third and fourth generation of Abraham. Remember God told Abraham the fourth generation will come out and this was the fourth generation. And he's saying, forgive them. In Exodus 32, 13 and 14, uh, when he's up on the mountain trying to beg forgiveness for the golden calf apostasy, and what does he start with? Remember who? Yes. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self, and you said to them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land I've spoken of will I give to your seed, and they shall inherit it for how long? And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do to his people. Can you imagine? How many of you would have the gall to tell God to repent? (laughs) Wow. You know, what did God want to do? He, at this time at the golden calf, he, he, said, he told Moses, wipe all of Israel out. I'm going to start over with you. Forget my covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I want to start over and we're just going to make of you a great nation. Now, how many of us would say, score? Yeah, woohoo! Yeah, it's all about me. Okay, let's start. Yeah, get them. How often, I mean, think about it. Get them, God. Yeah, they were rebellious. They made this golden calf. You're going to make of me a great nation. It's all about me. Wipe them out. And yet, what did Moses say? Did he think about himself? He didn't even think about the Israeli people. He said, but God, if you wipe them all out, they're going to say you couldn't do it. You couldn't keep your covenant to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, you know, today, if you believe in replacement theology, you're saying, guess what, God? If you couldn't do it, sorry, you weren't powerful enough to bring Israel into the land and keep your covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So check them. You now have us. Do we want to be like Moses and tell God, no, God, you repent. We're, I mean, I don't have time to go into that Torah portion, but the Torah portion is incredible because you know what God said to Moses? He says, okay, Moses, I'll go with you. And in Hebrew, the word there is in you in the singular. In other words, okay, I'm just going to accompany you, not the rest of Israel as we go into the land. And you know what God said to Moses? No, nope, sorry, not acceptable. He said, God, only if you go with all of us, that the world will know that you keep covenant with all of us. And that's what I believe is coming in these last days. We're going to have the spirit of Moses and we're gonna say, okay, when it comes to Israel, God, we're gonna believe you made covenant and they're coming into the land and your people are going to be successful, right? All right, a little preaching here. Okay, look, let's go to this next PowerPoint. Here we go. Do you see the word for humble right here? The top is, look at your notes, Psalms 10, 12. It says, arise, O Lord God, lift up your hand, forget not the humble. That's the word for humble. But do you know what's incredible? Look at Numbers 12, 3. It says, the man Moses is very humble, more than any of the men who are on the face of the ground. How many of you know the Bible talks about Moses' humility? Whenever it says, you don't see this in English, but you see it in Hebrew, and I think I mentioned it last week or the week before. Whenever it says very humble or very anything, they have the same word twice. They just repeat the word. But look at it the second time, all of a sudden what happened, a letter Yud, which speaks of humility, has been added to the word humble. Speaking of not only the emphasis of Moses' great humility, but adding the letter Yud says he even saw himself as very small. You know, he didn't think of himself, yes, I'm the one that God speaks to all the time. Thus saith the Lord, let me tell you what he had to say. You know, he was humble. So what is this telling us? Greatness is achieved through humility. In order to acquire Torah, the sages say one must first be humble so they will open to the truth rather than constantly seek to defend their own opinion. Okay. (laughs) Greatness is achieved through humility. Therefore, in order to acquire Torah wisdom, 
One must first be humble so they will be open to the truth rather than constantly seeking to defend their own opinion. That's not on your notes. I didn't write that on your notes. Let me say it one more time. In order to acquire Torah wisdom, one must first be humble so they will be open to the truth rather than constantly seeking to defend their own opinion. Pretty interesting. Okay, man. All right, let me see where I'm at. One of the interesting things too, when you look at Yeshua, was not Yeshua humble? Look at Philippians 2.8, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. And what does Yeshua's name begin with? The letter Yud, the name of God, the Yud, hey, Vav, hey. God is humble, he begins his name with the letter Yud. Yeshua's humble, he begins his name with the humble letter Yud. Psalms 22.6, everyone's familiar with this psalm, definitely a messianic psalm. And what does the Messiah say of himself? I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Snakes attack. How many of you have been attacked by a worm? Okay, a, a worm, <laughs> a worm gets walked on, gets crushed. And the, talk about small, talk about humility, talk about low. But look at Jacob. What does Jacob's name begin with? Yaakov, the letter Yud. And his name was changed to what? Which begins with the letter Yud. As a matter of fact, that was the only letter that remained of his name. And look what God says concerning Israel in Isaiah 41, 14. Fear not, you worm, Jacob. And you men of Israel, I will help you, says the Lord, and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. You know what? When people think they got it all together, they don't need any help. That's when you're in trouble. But when you stay, stay humble, and then you can ask God to help you. And I tell you what, I kind of like his help. So when Jacob's name changed to Israel, all that remained of his former name was the letter Yud. As a matter of fact, we know from Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7, it says, the Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people for you were what? The fewest, you were the smallest, you were the least. That's why he chose them. There's a, uh, they also had a nickname called Yeshurun, okay? You'll see that in Deuteronomy 33, 26. Uh, and that name means to be upright. It also means, the root word means to be righteous, okay? And it says, Deuteronomy 33, 26, there is none like unto the God of Yeshurun who rides upon the heaven in your help and is in his excellency on the sky. Boy, wouldn't that be great to have God riding in the heavens coming to help you? But here, that's their nickname. And I'm gonna, let's go to this next clip here. Oh, first off, what is that word? L, which means what? God, it's the first, like Elohim, El, right? Now we just got done on your notes, you saw the root word of that word, and it is what? Okay, Yashar, which means to be straight, to be upright, right? Okay, well what happens when you take that and you put it together, what do you get? Israel, Yisrael, okay? So what is that telling you? There is a straight way to God. And it's through the covenant with Israel. There is one way to God, it's a straight path to, to El, to God. And what do you see there? The name of what? Israel. It's through his covenant with Israel. John 4, he says, you worship, you know what you don't know. We know that we worship for salvation is of the, hmm, well, that's a tough verse. Okay, let's go to this next clip. Okay, do you see that word there? What, that's the word for praise, okay? 
What are the first two letters? The Yud and the Dalet, which is what? Yod, which is hand. In the word praise, it means you better be using your the letter hey means to reveal. Praising is your hands being revealed out of your pockets. So when we worship and praise, you lift your hands. That's right there in the word. Okay. Let's look at this next clip here. It's the revealed hand. Okay. Now, do you see this word here? What's this word here? And here, notice the yod hey vav hey. what's added? The Dalit, which is the door. And what's that name? Jews, Yehuda. So you have the word right here, the very name of God with the Dalit added and Yeshua is the door and he's from the tribe of Yehuda. Let's see. Where do I want to go here? Let me, in Esther 3, verse 6. It says, and they thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. That reminds me, you know what next Monday I believe is? Our Purim party right here. So next Monday night, we won't do a letter. We'll do the Purim party, but y'all have to come. Because this is very significant time. Okay, but anyway, they thought uh, they wanted to lay hands on Mordecai alone for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy who? All the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. What tribe was Mordecai from? And he was called Jewish, even though he's from the tribe of Benjamin. Do you see that right there? The Yud Dalet is Yod. The Yud Vav Dalet is Yud. You follow me? Yod, Yud. And what's interesting is that is Yeshua. And that is the first word of Devar, which is the word. And so you have Yeshua connected to his word. Okay, in the word of his power and the hand of his power, which is just kind of fascinating. But do you remember that Yeshua said not one jot or tittle would pass from the law? Let me show you something here. Okay, there, I just chose the word chai, which is life. So that, when it says the jot, that's another word for the yod. The tittle is this little mark. And so he says, not only will the smallest letter not pass, but the smallest mark on the smallest letter won't pass until everything is fulfilled. So, I'm going to tell you a story here about a man named Jed. No, Solomon. <laughs> Just kidding. It so happened, and you see it in this verse if you look down. When he said that, did you know he was talking about King Solomon? That's right. I don't know if you, how many of you have heard this story. But in Matthew 5, 18, when he said not one jot or tittle will pass from the Torah... Every Jew that was there knew he was talking about King Solomon. And so I'm gonna tell you the story that was told back then, okay? The story I'm gonna tell you is over 2,000 years old. And this is the story that they knew, and this is how they knew it referred to Solomon. And when you read the rest of the verses, you see here where he refers to Solomon, how he was even clothed with nothing like the flowers of the field and all of his glory and all this kind of thing. The story goes, if you remember in Deuteronomy, the king had to write his own Torah scroll. So Solomon is having the Levite standing over his shoulder while he's writing his Torah scroll. Okay. And he comes to Deuteronomy 17, verse 16, where it says, the king will, is not to multiply horses for himself. He's not to cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself that his heart turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Well, the phrase, neither shall he multiply wives, the Levite said Solomon had a real trouble with that one. Okay, so let's go to this next clip. 
Here is the, the word he was supposed to write, right here. That's how he was supposed to write it, okay? Which is, he shall not multiply. But what did he do? That smallest letter, the most insignificant letter, he decided we don't need that letter. And so he wrote it like this. And that changes the tense to be, instead of he shall not multiply, to he did not multiply. Now, what's fascinating about this is watch as this unfold. Solomon has changed the tense of the verb. Now, instead of an imperative, he shall not, it implies his past multiplication of wives would not have the effect of leading his heart astray. He's so wise. He understands that if you multiply wives, your heart will be led astray. And he said, I am so wise, I can erase a jot from the Torah and in all my wisdom, I won't allow my heart to be led astray. Okay, in a famous midrash, Solomon arose and studied the reason God gave the commandment saying, why did God command he shall not multiply wives for himself? Was it not just to keep his heart from turning away? Well, I will multiply wives and my heart will not turn away. So in all of his great wisdom, Solomon supposed he understood the reasoning behind the commandment thinking, well, if I keep my heart from going astray, then I am free to multiply wives. Because he understood the principle of the law, he did not need to obey the literal meaning of it. The rationale is, I understand what the Torah really meant by such and such a commandment, therefore I don't need to actually keep that commandment. The Midrash continues. At the time, the letter Yud of the word Yerba went up to heaven and prostrated itself before God and said, Master of the universe, didn't you say that no letter would ever be abolished from the Torah? Behold, Solomon has now arisen and abolished one. Who knows? Today he has abolished one letter. Tomorrow he will abolish another till the whole Torah will be nullified. And God replied to the letter Yud, Solomon and a thousand like him will pass away, but the smallest tittle will not be erased from you. Now, we are not under the law in regard to salvation but it would be madness and folly to assume that by grace we possess some special immunity to God's commands. Do we exempt ourselves from the rule of God's laws? Do we place ourselves above the kings of Israel, even above Yeshua, the ultimate king of Israel who did not violate it? The Midrash continues in regard to this verse. 1 Kings 11:4, where it says, it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. The Midrash says it would have been better for Solomon to clean sewers than to have this verse eternally written of him. In Christian theology, we've often erased whole sentences and chapters of the Torah because we've assumed ourselves to be wiser than the Torah. We've taken our cues from King Solomon rather than King Yeshua. And if that is true, it would be better if we cleaned sewers rather than playing at theology. This is in my book I'm writing on Solomon and the book, The Song of Solomon that I hope to have out shortly. <clears throat> because the Song of Solomon is so misunderstood. Uh, for those that, that don't know, Solomon actually is a type of antichrist, not Christ. And that's a shocker for most people. But everything God said do not do, he did. God said do not multiply wives, he multiplied wives. God said do not marry foreign wives, he married foreign wives. God said do not multiply horses, he multiplied horses. God said don't multiply silver and gold, he multiplied silver and gold. God said don't uh, you know, he's, God said to tear down the altars to the pagan gods. Solomon built the altars to the pagan gods. Even to his wives, all of his wives, it says he built an altar. Well, his wives were children of Molech, the Ammon and the Moabites, who offered their firstborn children to their gods. So that means Solomon's firstborn child of those wives was sacrificed. Okay, people don't understand that that whole book of Solomon is totally misunderstood. So anyway, I'm writing a book on uh, how really what it's about, I'm running out of time, but it's, it, it's about God. Remember in 1 Samuel 8, God was upset that Israel wanted a king like all the other nations. Well, in Song of Solomon, you see King Solomon at the very beginning, but then all of a sudden she says, you know, who is this, this little shepherd boy whom my soul loves? Where do you make your flock to rest at noon? Okay, well, that's not King Solomon. That's, just, that's the shepherd of their soul. God was to be their shepherd. And so the Song of Solomon actually is a battle 
between the shepherd trying to win the bride away from an earthly king and back to him as their shepherd of their soul. So that's what's really going on. Okay, Jerusalem. Actually, there's no J's in Hebrew. Even the, the city of Jerusalem begins with the letter Yud. I'm gonna take a moment and talk about Pincus. How many of you know who Pincus is? That's another name for Phineas. I want you to notice something on this next clip. This letter Yud is made small in Phineas's name. And remember the letter Yud is what? A hand. And what did Phineas do in his hand? He took a spear and shish kebobbed. Okay, this couple that were being very bad. And this is only done once in all of the Torah. His name is mentioned several times, but only once. And we see it here in Numbers 25, six through eight, where it says, and behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brother and a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phineas, right here is where his, the letter Yud is all of a sudden made small. The son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron the priest saw it. He rose up from among the congregation, took a javelin in his hand. He went after the man of Israel into the tent thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was saved from the children of Israel. Well, remember the letter Yud means a closed hand. So picture the closed hand on the javelin. Well, the small Yud seems to indicate that even the small works we do with our hands for God go a long way towards the things of the kingdom. Let's look at this next clip. This is uh, in Ecclesiastes 2.20. It's written, therefore I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. This is the word for despair. Do you see the yud is at the beginning and the yud represents what? Your hand, your works. And here you have the word for fire. So despair is when all the works of your hands are just getting burned up. And that's what Solomon was saying. Solomon reached a point where he was just despairing. Because, uh, but anyway, it's, You'll have to get the book. <laughs> uh, if you remember, there's 10 commandments. So the Yud speaks of the number 10. We have 10 commandments. In uh, Exodus 20, 17 is the 10th commandment. And what is the 10th commandment? You shall not what? It is the letter Yud. Quit trying to grab everything. Mine, mine, mine. So it's interesting that the 10th commandment, the letter Yud, is don't go grabbing everything. Uh, the letter Yud is the number 10 marks completion and order. Uh, there were 10 generations from Adam to Noah. Okay, so the iniquity was made full and he brought the flood. There were 10 generations from Noah to Abraham. Uh, return to godliness was now complete, going the other direction. There was 10 plagues on Egypt. There's 10 days of awe. Uh, from, uh, goes to Yom Kippur, which is the 10th day. Uh, the number 10 is what's required for a minion or a quorum for corporate prayer. And if you remember, Israel tested God 10 times in the wilderness. Let's go to this last clip. Another interesting thing. This is the word yud. The numerical value is 20. And this is the word for vision, which is the number 20. And I, I really believe that as we do, we're not hearers only, but we're what? Doers. Then we're going to see the things of God like we really need to see. Amen. Thank you very much. So do we have any questions on any of this? How many love the letter Yud? Yay! I love you. It's so funny. I had an email today. Someone emails me. And they've been looking at these, I forgot what country or state they're from, but they go, I love Ian. I can hardly wait for Ian. I love the letter Ian. <laughs> I saw a hand somewhere back there. It was, oh, okay, here, uh, let's, we'll take a few questions. I don't know if you can turn the camera over to them or not, but. It's, it's interesting when you mention that in praise, the hands come up when a person humbles himself in surrender, then God. It goes back to the humility, the concept of the letter U. And in he the inhabits hand. those praises then. Yes. 
Yes, they say the, the letter U also looks like someone bowed over uh, in humility as well. Sure. It's interesting how the father put his letter on Joshua, on Sarah and Abraham. He put his hand on their lives. Yes. And now 4,000 years later, we're still talking about those lives. That's awesome. That is awesome. That shows you God's hand in all of this. One of the things I, I saw that I thought was really interesting, when you, when you saw his name, you know, Yohi Bafe, you know, and the nail in the middle and the hand that was closed, right? So what I thought of was the hand going through the window, holding both worlds together that's pierced by the word of his power. You know? Awesome. Isn't this great? I mean, see, God loves pictures. That's why he wrote it in the beginning in a picture language so even a child could see this. So let's stand and we'll close in prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for your Torah. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you that tonight people from all over the world, from Australia and Japan and Holland, uh, everywhere, Father, that they could uh, watch this live streaming. And I just pray that it worked. But Father, we just thank you so much for this technology. We thank you also that by the work of our hands and by giving, we can extend your word through all of the world. We just thank you again, Father, that allowing us to contribute to your ministry and to allow your Torah and your language to go throughout the world. In Yeshua's name, amen. Thank you very much. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries dot U.S. Be blessed and shalom.